I'm Dermot Murnahan with tonight's big story from the heart of the Cray Twins' one-time empire in the East End. We ask, should life mean life? <laughs> Good evening from the Blind Beggar pub in East London, scene of one of the most notorious murders ever. We're here for the first of a two-part big story special on murderers. Why are some kept in jail for most of their lives and others let out after just a few years? Well, yesterday John Major hit out at Liberals and said prison does work. He says it stops criminals committing crime. And now the Tories plan to build more prisons for our ever-growing number of criminals. They say punishment must no longer be a dirty word. Well, it wasn't good news for those who marched this week in support of the Cray twins, who'll be 60 next week. We'll be hearing later from their brother Charlie and others with passionate views on how we should treat killers. So are the Crays deserving cases? This is how the movies portray events here at the Blind Beggar 27 years ago. Ronnie Cray is out to settle a score with George Cornell, member of a rival gang. Well, well, well. Mr. Cray. Cornell had previously called Ronnie a queer and a fat puff. You haven't got a bottle. <laughs> Here, as so often, the Crays are presented as a threat only to other gangsters, not to society. Well, the fathers of men, yeah. But nothing unto other villains, the same as we were. We never involved the general public in it. It, it, it was as in our own people. Uh, I'm not saying it's right. What we did was wrong. Uh, when you look back on it, you can't go about killing people. But I don't think it was, it was done in that sense. The sense I'm talking about, we was all villain. They would have done to us what we'd done to them. They did do a murder, yeah. Um, but as I said, they kept it in the confines of their own little world they never uh, the things you hear today i mean ordinary people in the street get mugged and bashed up and old ladies they were never into stuff like that reggie and ronnie world-class villains you could trust with your granny's purse well that's the image the unrepentant craze have still done nothing to dispel they appeared in public with real heroes but in fact ronnie was a brutal madman first certified insane in 1958. Throughout the 60s, the twins ran extortion rackets and terrorized London's clubland, taking part in violent assaults themselves. They were brazen, even going on TV after their acquittal on an extortion charge. A lot of people have got the impression from this trial that clubland, London, is very tough. Do you think it is? You run a couple of clubs. Well, in all clubs, you get an occasional drunk, you know, and sometimes have to be slung out, and that's why there's dorm in there. But um, I suppose it's night club land all over the world, really. It's just the same as... I don't suppose it can be that bad as people wouldn't go to them, really, would they? Ronald, what do you think about club land in London? Well, I think most clubs are very respectable, you know, and uh, I don't think there's any trouble at all in them, except occasionally. <laughs> Jack the Hat McVitie was an occasional drunk who caused the craze trouble, so they murdered him. First, they enticed him into a flat in Stoke Newington. Reggie jumps on him, and he put a gun behind his head and tried to shoot him. Run! But the gun failed to go off. And next week, a knife was pushed into Reggie's hand, and he stabbed him. And that was that. He went down. He was dead. McVitie was killed for cheating on the twins. The Crays have never shown remorse for his murder. I would have done the same thing if I'd have been in Reggie Cray's shoes, in his position. You've got to understand who Reggie Cray was. He was at the pinnacle of his, of his career, if you want to put it that way. And to see Jack McVitie try to belittle him like he did, you can have that. The Cray twins were finally convicted in 1969. They were given life sentences with a recommendation they serve a minimum of 30 years. As the judge said, and he said this after the trial, these sentences will dim their minds so they never commit these crimes again. Their gang was destroyed, 
and many believe the long sentences deterred others from stepping into its place. I think the examples which were made in the, recent, in the 1960s of very long sentences for those who took part in gang activities has deterred many from indulging in that kind of crime. And I think it has had some deterrent effect. Sir Frederick Lawton tried the craze in another murder case. He believes men like them deserve long sentences. Those who are convicted of murder in the kind of circumstances where they are indulging in gang warfare, that's a very, very special kind of crime. It's really war on society. And society is entitled to say they must be put out of reach of society. In their heyday, the Crays used to hold court every morning here in the Polici Cafe. They used to sit at this very table. Then they were the predators. Today, they portray themselves as victims. They claim that they have been deliberately kept in prison because of their notoriety. But is this true? We've done a study of other criminals given life sentences at the same time as the Crays. Between 1965 and 1973, four years either side of the Cray's conviction, 947 people were given life sentences in Britain. According to the most recent Home Office figures, which go up to the end of 1991, 121 of these prisoners, nearly 13%, were still in jail. The Crays are hardly alone, and they're certainly not the most obvious candidates for early release. Jack Jowett, for example, has been in prison since 1960. He murdered his wife in a crime of passion. He was certainly no gangland premeditated killer. It's unfair to detain someone for as long as 34 years for committing a domestic murder. It, it can't be uh, right that in the absence of very strong evidence that the person in question is a real positive danger to the public, that they should be detained for that length. Two years ago, Jack Jowett married Brenda Rickard, his former prison visitor. Mr. Jowett is Britain's longest serving prisoner. And but for Mrs. Jowett and some of us who've been raising this issue from time to time, and the media tends to take it up about once every six months, he would have been left there to die. There were allegations which Jowett denied that he misbehaved on parole 10 years ago. But now he's old and sick, and his wife says she wants to look after him at home till he dies. To my mind, he's very ill, what with uh, strokes and emphysema. It seems to me to be um, a most flagrant um, transgression against ordinary human justice. There are these baffling cases that uh, one gets where the length of detention actually serves seems to bear no relation either to a legitimate punitive object or to the objective of protecting the public from someone who is a real risk to the public. Baz Lewis pleaded guilty to murder in 1968. It was another crime of passion. His chances of release have been threatened by an unproved claim that he committed a crime when on home leave four years ago. The prison service never investigated the truth of the allegation and despite Mr Lewis's denials and despite the fact there was good evidence that he was nowhere near the incident in question, he was in fact taken back into the secure part of the prison system and his release was delayed by uh, a number of years. He's still currently in custody. Les Wright murdered his girlfriend's husband 22 years ago, again a killing far removed from gangland. He's been rebelling against the Home Office's parole system, but his prison visitors and others believe he should now be freed. Again, you have a case here where the problem is not so much the dangerousness of Mr Wright. I think all parties are agreed that he's probably not a danger to the public. It's simply a case of the fact that he won't or can't jump through the sorts of hoops that the Home Office want him to do. So, when judges impose life sentences, when do they mean life and when do they mean just a few years? In a small number of cases like the Crays, the judge announces a minimum recommended sentence in open court. 
But in most cases, the number of years a prisoner must serve is agreed between the judge and the Home Office behind closed doors. And these terms can at any time be revised upwards or downwards by the Home Secretary without the prisoner's knowledge. Nobody knows what life means. It certainly doesn't mean life in the vast majority of cases. And so what happens is that somebody has to make sense of this life sentence behind closed doors. In the case of the Crays, although the judge did recommend a 30-year minimum sentence, that sentence was probably reviewed by a Home Secretary somewhere around 1983 when the current system came into being. Now, we simply do not know what the minimum tariff uh, faced by the Crays actually is. So why have the Crays been singled out for a public campaign? The truth about the craze has now been obscured by the myth. This is the Repton Boys Boxing Club, a legendary part of that myth. The twins were famous fighters here. And when they became big-time gangsters, they also gave money to the club and other charities, posing as public-spirited businessmen. It's partly because of that myth that so many people campaign for their release now. Reggie Cray, I can only say that he was a perfect uh, gentleman. That was nice enough person, you, as long as you didn't cross them. Well, I mean, uh, the other thing is, they never harmed anyone else but their own, their own kind, didn't they? They help poor people. They give poor people. They never done anything wrong to them. In their own, in his own way, he was, you can compare him with the, the, the stories of Robin Hood. He did help a lot of uh, people. I think if I think if they was there now, that we wouldn't have all this uh, trouble we got. They, What's that? A die word. If you've got trouble at all, of any uh, physical trouble, you could go to the craze and, and ask for that, some help. She'll never walk again, Reg. Her back was broken. Her mother depends on her, Ron. This is the myth of the Cray brothers righting wrongs. You would think someone would do something. It's a bit like the Mafia. Yeah, you would like me. Yeah. We should make sure they're all right. The girl and her mother. You know, there were some certain bullies in the East End at the time, and if anybody mentioned that to Mrs Cray, who mentioned it to her sons, that would be completely stopped. In, and that's in Ronnie Cray's own words, he always says, with a quick slap. But nowadays it would probably be a very violent action. The Crays, seen here in a family home movie, were vicious killers. But their supporters, in a rewriting of the Prime Minister's views on law and order, portray them as upholders of traditional conservative values. John Major says something the other week now, uh, I think it was in the press, and he said this, I don't want the youngsters coming up becoming like the Crays. Well, I'll say something about that to John Major here. Now, if the kids today were like the Crays, perhaps it would be a better place. Because they had respect, people respected them. They kept the East End a lot clean. Ronnie Cray leaves his mother's funeral in 1982. He's now a paranoid schizophrenic in Broadmoor and likely to stay there all his life. The campaign is for the release of Reggie, who's tried to build an image as a great benefactor. He claims hundreds of people write to him in prison every month and he tries to help them all. The image now is just a kindly old gent. Reggie has now adopted a new career, poet, and he's also adopted unofficially a young boy, Brad Lane, who read us one of the poems. This, this is called The Fall of Tear, Fall of a Tear. The fall of a tear brings you near, each tear seems to represent another year. I think the Home Office are a bit frightened of their notoriety, and I think that's one of the reasons that you know, they've not got parole now. What they don't seem to realise is they've got so many supporters all over the country um, that the longer they keep them in, the bigger the notoriety is going to get. They passed on a legend. I hope not in a bad way, because they weren't bad men. None of us were bad men. We weren't good. And we weren't bad. We weren't evil either. And that's, that's a strong point, I think. Reggie Cray's claim that he's being victimised because of his notoriety doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Indeed, if the law proceeds as usual, the man who's still a local hero and seems to regret nothing will be in prison for a while yet. It is unusual for a prisoner to be released before they've served the minimum term that a judge has declared in open court.
one of the aspects which has to be taken into consideration that the parole board should be satisfied that the particular prisoner really accepts that what he did in the past was wrong and des deserved punishment. If that's present and the parole board is satisfied it is, there is a case for letting them out. But if it's not present, then they ought not to be let out. They should serve their full sentence. Well, to discuss the issues raised there, I'm joined by the crazed brother, Charlie, and others with strong views on the sentencing of murderers. Uh, Charlie Cray, taking up the point made by Sir Frederick Lawton at the end of our film there, if your brothers express no remorse, why should they be let out early? Well, because they're not liars. I've been in prison, and most people who say they're sorry are never sorry. They never show any remorse. They say it because they want parole, and they get it. So because my brothers are telling the truth, then they're, they're penalised. Why? I don't care what anyone says, maybe one or two, very rarely in prison. No, none of them show anything. They, they show it just to get parole. And the parole system is a bad thing for that rule alone. No, my brothers won't tell lies. They tell the truth. They said, if we're not sorry, and that's it. Do you think, though, that your brothers are any different from some of the other lifers we saw in our film there who are still inside, many of them who were sent down before your brothers? Well, by what I heard just now, uh, the comments made, all those people, how long they've done, they've been out, they've been released and brought back. My brothers have been, never been released, or they've committed some, uh, there's a reason for it. But my brothers have never uh, been released, so why should they be put on the same conditions as them? Never. Well, John McVicker, you've served time yourself for violent crimes. Have the Cray twins been inside long enough? But I think you've got to separate Ronnie and Reggie. As you've made a point in the film, Ronnie's in Broadmoor and he's under a different system. With Reggie, um, one of the points I think you missed is that, albeit he's sentenced to 30 years, and again, he's subject to that claim. There is a case, perhaps not in law, but in general terms, for saying that he acted under duress because he was urged into doing the killing that he's convicted of, Jack McVitie, by his dominant twin who he was in the thrall of all his life. And by the nature of it, he couldn't use that in his defense, but he was pushed into it, because Ronnie was urging Reggie to do your one, do your one. And there was a case for, I would think, given the time he served, for a measure of clemency, and to try and, let's say, get him out on early release, that kind of thing. Well, let me bring in Sir Teddy Taylor here. You've got strong views on law and order. The Cray twins are old men who've served long sentences. They're unlikely to do any harm if and when they get out, shouldn't they be let out? Definitely not, because quite frankly, the court said a minimum of 30 years, and if you're going to disregard that, then in fact you're going to undermine the deterrent value of sentencing. The film confirmed that they were in fact, despite perhaps their alleged kindly motives now, running a reign of terror in this part of London, and if a judge says you need to have 30 years, then I'm afraid it's just going to undermine the whole purpose of deterrence if you're going to say, well, we'll let them out now. Now, of course, the other thing, don't disregard. I mean, you might think this is not appropriate here. I get fed up to the teeth with people who forget the simple fact that since the abolition of capital punishment, 55 people have come out of prison having served a sentence for murder and killed again. Now, you may say that's not relevant here, but you can't ignore it. I think of the innocent people who are the victims of crime, and so definitely I would say no. Well, we'll take up your point about deterrence a bit later, but let me bring in Richard Ferguson, QC, first. As a barrister, do you think it's right that people like the Crays, who've been given minimum recommended sentences, should serve every last minute of them? Well, yes. If the judge at the trial thought that that was the appropriate penalty, he heard the case with the jury, he heard the evidence, he took that view. Uh, what might change, perhaps, in later years is the, uh, the health of the defendants. That's obviously a very material consideration. One must administer a humane system of justice. Uh, but. Uh, for my part, I think before one could answer this question, yes or no, to the release, one would have to know a lot more about the, uh, the background. I would like to know more about whether the police are satisfied, there's no risk of any return to any former activities. I assume not. But these are the sort of things that the public would be concerned with. Well, let's touch on the broader point. If Sir Teddy and other members of the Conservative Party have their way, our prisons are going to be filling up with people, not just murderers, serving longer and longer sentences. Yeah. Is there any evidence that the longer a sentence is, the more it acts as a deterrent? Absolutely not. And, and I think the, the sad thing is that uh, in the 
turmoil created by law and order becoming a political football, it's become very easy to uh, pander to certain sections of the community by saying lock more people up, lock them up for longer, as if that's going to solve the problem. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem. All we're going to do is have our pr prisons more and more crowded, it'll cost us more and more money, and will it work? Well, Charlie Cray, did your brothers help solve the problem while they were here? We heard in that film that they acted as pillars of the community. Did they help keep other criminals from acting on this patch? Yeah, they tried, they stopped them. No one seems to have other people like they do today. And that gentleman there mentioned something just now about people, um, 55 people being released and killed again. Of course he's right. I'll tell you what he's right about. Not about the twins, about them. Most of them were rapists who've killed women and children. So why is it they allowed them out and this gentleman never said anything about it well, then? Well, now he's talking about my brother. generally agree? He should have mentioned this when they were released. Do you generally agree with I wonder with if he would Teddy say the same thing if, if they let the ripper out, Sutcliffe. I wonder if he'd talk up against him. But all these people, most of them are rapists, of children, of women. I don't know whether their parents or their wives would feel about it, okay. but they're the most people being released and Charlie, killed again. I've seen it. Charlie, I, it's not what I'm not, but I don't want to send more people to prison. And it's simply not the case that there's no evidence that sentences don't deter. Look at a simple one. It's out of action now. Look at capital punishment. Could our bright legal friends say, why was it that in between 1945 and 1965, when capital punishment was available to the courts, the number of murders actually went down over 20 years? Why is it since abolition the number of murders have soared and the number of crimes involving use of guns has soared? Well, so if you have strong <laughs> sentences, it does deter, and it's simply not fair to say to the public outside there's no evidence they deter. The evidence was there, clear and precise. And believe me, if you have tough sentences which are specific and clear, they do deter, and the evidence is there. Well, so well, Teddy, just, just, let, just, 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 let, just let me ask, ask you this question. Are all killers the same? Are the killers of young children, are the killers of, of their wives in moments of passion, and the Cray twins all the same in your book? They're certainly not the same. Some people but you can deserve, never deter. There will always be some sentences. murder, but there are a number you can deter. And the evidence is there. Where is the evidence? Keep the evidence. The evidence. There. Look, Show me the evidence. I mean, yes, evidence. The evidence. When you had punishment. capital punishment, 1945, but 206. Capital 206. 206. 1965, 196. In other words, the figure had gone down year no, by year. I John, I John, John, John I mean, I've got these from the House of Commons Library road, and from the Home Secretary. You go down this road every time you get on discussion. But hang people, true. hang people. No, no, come on. You know very well. There's been a number. There are a number of studies in America where one state has brought back the death penalty in another, adjoining states, and the murder rate in each state remains the same, albeit that one's brought in capital punishment, the other one doesn't have it. So you, it's a nonsense. The comparisons this business. are basically both, no, no, as you no, know, in not America, both because regardless. you... No, I'm not going to get drawn with this. But, but the, other, at, no, the other... No, please, you've had your say. The other point you keep making, that these people who come out and kill again, they're often the very people who would have never been hung anyway even if there was capital punishment, because yeah. they're often domestic killers. Well, and I Charlie, agree there are a number of them, but this is nonsense, this idea that if you bring the rope back, you will deter um, killing. It's nonsense. It's not going to come back. I was simply saying it shows when you have strong, specific it's deterrence. It's not them in the United States. States. We have seen evidence recently it, 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 of people being murdered in states where they have capital punishment. Are you telling me it's stopping those murders? It doesn't seem to be. Let me no, ask Charlie Cray here. Charlie Cray, can you tell us that if the twins came out now, there would be absolutely no threat to society. Where well, can they be? Uh, the quiet people want to carry on with their life, and that's sort of what they've got left of it. But one thing I would like to ask, and it always puzzles me, if my brother had been killed by the two people they were supposed to have killed, which could have happened, that's the reason it happened, would they have still been in prison? Never. They'd have been there for 12 years and they'd have been released by now. And no one can say differently. They would have been released by now. If they'd have 30-year minimum, they'd no, have been no, no, for 30 no, years. No, 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 no. They wouldn't have got a 30-year minimum because they'd have been different. Why? It wasn't be the why, why did I don't know why, out? but they wouldn't have got it. Final point, gentlemen. We're coming to the end here. Final point, Charlie Cray. Do you think you will ever see your brothers well, walk into this so, part again? Well, I hope so. I think I should because Hess was in once years ago and he's supposed to kill thousands of people. But when he was in many years, everyone all over the wall was crying, why did they hold this man? It's ridiculous, and that's the same thing with the twins. Why should they be different to anyone else? Never. Well, that's it for this week. Next week, we look at murderers who've been released early, only to kill again. I'm Dermot Murnahan. Good night.